first four weeks, I talked about greenhouse gas emission reduction and the costs of that. The second four weeks, I talked about the impacts of climate change. Uh, and now, in the last four weeks, we're going to bring it together in a cost-benefit analysis and sort out what is the optimal emission reduction. Uh, so this morning, I'm going to talk about uh, a first best uh, look at optimal emission reduction, and this afternoon I'm going to look at a welfare maximizing uh, form of uh, emission reduction, and then next week we're going to talk about um, game theory, where we're going to look at how national social planners will do this rather than a global social planner. Before that, I'm going to look a little bit uh, into international climate policy, and in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, uh, the countries of the world negotiated the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and Article 2 of that treaty uh, is reproduced here with one typo. The UNFCCC was ratified by essentially all countries in the world. The Holy See is holding out, North Korea is holding out, but other than that, everybody signed up. And they did so within three years. In 1995, uh, three years after it was negotiated, this treaty actually entered uh, into force already, uh, which is quite quickly. And part of its success, I think, is um, due to Article 2. And what does Article 2 say? The ultimate objection of this treaty is to achieve stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that will prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Such a level should be achieved within the, the time frame is sufficient to allow, to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally, to ensure that food production is not threatened, and to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable way. But it's very hard to disagree with this, right? Yeah, so essentially what this says is we should prevent danger. And preventing danger is something that we can all agree on, um, that it is a good thing. So its aim is immediately laudable, uh, but then if you actually look at how danger is defined, then you find there's a lot of leeway for interpretation. Because we say we want to stabilize concentrations at the level that would allow ecosystems to adapt naturally coming. But we don't really understand ecosystems well enough to define this, that this, you can interpret this as a very stringent, stringent level, but then again, ice ages are natural as far as we know, uh, and the projected warming for the next century is actually comparable to stuff we've seen at the end of every ice age since times uh, immemorial, right? So if that is your natural adaptation, then we actually don't impose much of a constraint. At the same time, we want to make sure that food production is not threatened, but the nature of the threat to food production is actually not specified. Do we mean that climate change should not threaten food production? Actually, when we talked about the impacts of climate change, we did not see much of a threat to food production um, from climate change. Uh, whereas when we talked about biofuels and bioenergy, we actually found that that may impose a greater threat to food production. So this may actually be interpreted as a break on our, emission, on our uh, ambition to reduce emissions. Right? do want to go for very serious emission reductions, we may need an area the size of India to grow the amount of energy uh, needed uh, to cut emissions very, very deeply, or even push them below zero. And then the third condition is that whatever we do, economic growth should not be threatened. And that, of course, can be interpreted as a way of blocking any emission reduction program. Right? So essentially, the, the second sentence in Article 2 can in, be interpreted in whatever way you want. It can be interpreted in a very green way, but it also can be interpreted in a very brown way. And that is, of course, the art of diplomacy coming up with language that everybody agrees on. Because everybody can walk away with this and interpret what was agreed in a very different way depending on the national service. And I think this waffle partly explains the success
of uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The first sentence of Article 2 actually does have major ramifications, and it is my belief that the people who drafted Article 2 were not aware of the implications of what they uh, wrote up. And I know one of them uh, reasonably well, I know the other one very well, and I don't think that in 1992 when they wrote this language they understood the meaning of the word stabilization. So what does stabilization imply? Let's consider a simple uh, carbon cycle model, a first order linear difference equation where the concentration of greenhouse gases M at time t is a linear function of emissions in the year before, of concentrations in the year before, and part of it is uh, degraded or depreciated as an economist would call it. Uh, and then of course we add emissions to the stock of CO2 in the atmosphere. So if this were the way to characterize the carbon cycle, and what does stabilization implies? Well, stabilization implies that the concentration doesn't change, so mt is equal to mt minus 1, or you could phrase it differently, stabilization implies that you can drop the subscripts from your difference equation. So what we have then is that m is delta m uh, plus e, or put differently, that the concentration is equal to the emissions over 1 minus uh, the degradation coefficient. And if we can't agree on the same level of uh, concentrations, there is no safe level of emissions either, right? There's the two, this is just the relationship between the two. If we can't agree on M, then we haven't agreed on E either. So, Article 2 doesn't seem to imply anything about emissions either. It didn't imply anything about concentrations, it doesn't imply anything about emissions. If this is the appropriate representation of the carbon cycle. Previously, I showed you this cartoon uh, of the carbon cycle and all the stocks and flows that are going on there. And we talked about the concentration of fossil fuels, and we talked about uh, what was going on in the surface ocean, and we talked about the exchange between the atmosphere and uh, the terrestrial vegetation. But I did not talk about this flow of CO2 at all. And the reason you may think was that maybe we have magnitudes of 120 or 70 or 6, the magnitude of this particular flow is only 0.2, so it is irrelevant. Right? Essentially what this flow represents is that part of the CO2 is in the atmosphere is taken up by a geological process called rock weathering. So if you have a particular type of rock, uh, particularly a rock containing uh, calcium, it reacts with the CO2 in the atmosphere, and as a result, part of that CO2 is removed from the atmosphere. And essentially, because it takes CO2 from the atmosphere, this means that the rock in question is growing. Rocks grow at a very slow rate, as you may have gathered. And this process is a very slow process that takes place at geological timescales rather than at human timescales. That has substantial implications for climate policy. Um, in a uh, paper published in 1987, Ernst Meyer Reimer and Klaus Hasselmann argued that we should not think of the carbon cycle as a single difference equation but we should actually see the, the, the carbon cycle, or the atmospheric part of the carbon cycle, as a system of different equations. And really what they say is that the atmospheric concentration of CO2 M is the sum of five separate concentrations, and then each concentration is governed by its own difference equation, linear difference equation, first order, which is the same as we saw before. M is delta M plus E, but of course now we have to apportion our emissions to uh, the various parts of the carbon cycle in the atmosphere and the sum of the alphas and it needs to be one, otherwise uh, the numbers simply add, uh, don't add up. And what they argued, and this has been confirmed by numerous later studies, is that each of the five carbon cycles 
has its own characteristic half-life, that is, has its own rate at which CO2 is removed from the atmosphere. And in about 15% of the cases, half of CO2 is removed within two years, and then in 20% of the cases, it takes 17 years to remove half of the CO2 from the atmosphere, and there's a bit that takes 60, 74 years to remove half. There's a bit that takes 363 years to remove half of the CO2 from the atmosphere, and then there is a bit, and that's about 13% at the moment, where the removal from the atmosphere happens at the geological time scale and at the human time scale, essentially, this takes forever. So this has an implication, right? I mean, what we said, if you want to stabilize emission, uh, if you want to stabilize concentrations M, then we should set M equal to E over 1 minus delta. But one of our deltas is 1. So that doesn't work, right? So then we have M is E over 0. And dividing by 0 is typically problematic. Now, that is one way of solving this equation. We can also just return to this equation here, right? and say, well, delta is 1, so m is m plus e. There is a solution to this equation, and that is that e is 0, which implies that the only way to stabilize CO2 concentrations is to drive emissions to 0. And international law says we must stabilize concentrations. So international law does not say we must drive CO2 emissions uh, or we must reduce emissions by 50% or by 80% or by 90%. No, international law binds us to reduce emissions by 100%. So that's international law, right? Now let's look at this from uh, an economic perspective. And we want to find optimal uh, emission reduction. So what do we do when we optimize? Uh, if you have a simple static optimum as depicted here, then the marginal cost should equal the marginal benefits, right? So that's the first order condition for optimality. Marginal costs uh, should equal marginal uh, benefits, or marginal net social gain should equal zero, right? Uh, so this is our standard cost-benefit diagram. In emissions on the horizontal axis, we have some notion of gain and loss on the vertical axis. If emissions are zero, no damage is done. The higher emissions are, the greater the damage done at the margin. This point here is where there's no reason to use more energy. You're sick of driving, your house is warm enough, and so on and so forth, right? So at this point, you're not using additional uh, energy. So this is the unregulated uh, market equilibrium. Then when you start pushing emissions down, First, it is fairly cheap uh, to do so, and it gets steadily more expensive to reduce emissions further. So that this, uh, the brown curve here, and then the social optimum is where the two marginal curves meet. And this is the optimal level of emissions. So this is uh, graphically, we've seen this graph many, many times before. You could also do it analytically, where you want to maximize welfare. Uh, by choosing, you know, to maximize welfare by choosing emissions E. Welfare is defined as benefits of emission reduction minus cost of emission reduction. It's an unconstrained optimization, so we simply set the W D E equal to zero. So D V D E minus D C D E must equal zero, or the marginal benefits of emission reduction must equal the marginal costs of emission reduction. That is, if we do a static optimization, of course, the problem like climate change is a dynamic problem, right? It's not defined in one particular year, uh, but it stretches out over centuries. The way we typically think of optimal emission reduction or emission reduction is that the benefits are a stock. Uh, the reason we want to reduce emissions is because we will have less pronounced climate change for a very long period into the future, so that is a flow of future benefits, right? Whereas we typically think of emission reduction as a cost that is incurred here and now. And so one half of the problem is static, the other part, half is uh, dynamic. And the way we uh, picture this is 
We want to maximize welfare by choosing not emissions at time T, but choosing emissions at all periods of the future, emissions now, emissions a year from now, emissions two years from now, net present welfare is benefits minus costs. The benefits depend on our emission reduction effort at that time, the year before that, the year before that, and so on and so forth, until today, right? Uh, whereas the costs, as I said, are typically seen as instantaneous. So the costs T, uh, the cost C at time T only depend on emission reduction E at time T. Oh, that is our welfare at every uh, time T, and then of course you have to discount the whole thing with the discount rate R. Uh, so this is our net present welfare. And then if you take the first partial derivative and equal it to, set it equal to zero, then, because this thing is instantaneous, this just remains dc, uh, de, right? Uh, but the benefits have not changed in nature. So what do we have here? We have the sum of s is zero to whatever. So we have the benefit, the marginal benefits of reducing emissions at the same time, S is zero, not discounted. Then we have the marginal benefits the year thereafter, T plus one. But of course, the decision that we're making is about the emissions at time T, right? Two years from the point of emission reduction, three years from the point of emission reduction. And of course, this whole thing needs to be discounted uh, back to the then present time. And this holds for all uh, time, right? For all uh, periods. Conceptually, nothing has changed, right? What we previously had was that marginal costs equal marginal benefits. What we now have is that marginal costs equals the net present value of a stream of marginal benefits. But we still have that costs and benefits are equated at the margin, right? <coughs> so, in terms of in, in intuitive understanding of where the optimum is, they're still at the same point, right? Marginal cost plus equal marginal benefits. Now, we talked about the marginal costs of emission reduction in the first block, and we, I showed the table. Here we have the same thing uh, graphically. So this is the result of those 14 models that I showed before. On the horizontal axis, we're looking at where concentrations would be in the year 2100. If we impose a carbon tax that is depicted on the uh, vertical axis, the way to read this is that if you impose a carbon tax in the year 2015 worldwide and all emissions, you let the carbon tax grow with uh, the interest rate over time. If your carbon tax in the year 2015 is 10, then you end up uh, at around, this must be 350, uh, at around uh, 700 parts per million by volume of CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere. If you don't impose a carbon tax, you end up at around 750, right? So a $10 carbon tax will get you down to 700. Then a $100 carbon tax uh, will get you down to 675, sorry. And a $1,000 carbon tax will get you down to <coughs> 425, right? That is how to read this graph. So this is the carbon tax you impose, this is where you end up. You can also invert the graph and say, I want to be here. So this is then the carbon tax that I should impose, and this is, I think, roughly 200. We also talked about our willingness to pay for climate policy, right? We talked about the social cost of carbon. And here we have a PDF uh, of that thing, if we assume a 3% uh, pure rate of time preference or a 5% discount. And this is, as I explained, is not the instantaneous benefit, but this is the net present value of the stream of benefits from reducing climate change. And what we have here is that the median, or sorry, the mode, uh, is around $25 per ton of C, right? And I've shown on the uh, horizontal axis, and then we have the, prob the, the probability density on the vertical axis. So this is our willingness to pay for climate policy, or this is our uh, marginal benefit. Now, if we impose a carbon tax of $25, that's right here, we end up at around 650 
PPM, right? That is not very drastic initially. Now, this is sort of an approximate cost-benefit analysis. Bill Nordhaus of Yale published a more elaborate, more elegant uh, way of doing cost-benefit analysis, essentially. He built a big, he built a dynamic optimization problem, which at the time he built it was big, but of course computers now have progress, so it's pretty small. But Nordhaus' date was roughly what I just told you, right? He equated the marginal costs to the marginal benefits. And what he did was he found that the social cost of carbon is as displayed here. Uh, he imposed the carbon tax around the year 2015, not after 25 that I suggested, but more like 40, and then he let it rise over time. So he's slightly more aggressive uh, than what I just suggested. Uh, and if this is the carbon tax you impose, and you do all the other things that Nordhaus did in uh, that particular paper, what he finds is that this is the optimal concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Where in black, we're looking at unregulated CO2 concentration, and of course this is a fairly arbitrary scenario. We talked about scenarios uh, in week one, right? But then with uh, emission reduction, with optimal climate policy, we go from around 700 ppm in the atmosphere in the year 2100 to around 600. Right? So you do see emission reduction. And this is welfare maximization. So it is in our best collective interest to reduce emissions. At the same time, this is no stabilization. right? The green curve is not stabilization of CO2. CO2 is rising. right? It's just rising at a slower rate than it otherwise uh, would have. What did we just conclude, right? What did Nordhaus in 1992 uh, say? Um, and essentially he asks the question, if the world were ruled by a benevolent dictator, what would she do, right? So we have a philosopher queen, and her aim is to maximize global welfare, not just of all the people in the world at the moment, but over time, right? Now, what would this philosopher queen do? And the way to characterize what Nordhaus found was a little bit of emission reduction in the beginning, more emission reduction later, but nowhere near stabilization. And those three parts of the conclusion are here given in three different color colors. So let's start with a little bit of emission reduction to start with. And of course, what Nordhaus did was just one model one. Right? What I just showed you was just the result of one particular model, one particular parameterization, uh, one particular choice of future emissions, future population, uh, one particular representation of the carbon cycle and the climate change and the impacts of climate change. And all of these things are hugely uncertain right? and hugely controversial. So the fact that there is one particular model that says this is what we should be doing is not enough. How robust are these conclusions? The first bit, right, that we should start slow, is extremely robust, right? It doesn't matter what you do with your model, it doesn't matter what parameters you stick in, what assumptions you make, you always find this. And the reason for this is essentially because, and we discussed this uh, in week two, uh, the reason for this is that a lot of our emissions are essentially determined by choices we made in the past. The energy use of a building is determined by the structural characteristics of that building. Your demand for energy for commuting depends on where you work, where you go to school and where you live. Right? Those decisions are not, or th those are not things that we easily change. Right? You change them uh, only every so often. And that means that if you impose a carbon tax now or any other form of, uh, of climate policy, and if we do it through a carbon tax, then essentially you're punishing people, you're not changing people's behavior, but instead you're punishing them for decisions they made in the past when climate policy wasn't there yet. And that leads to huge dead weight losses, or if you impose a carbon tax that is uh, high enough, that leads to enormous capital dis uh, destruction. In China, they're still building 
coal-fired power plants. Lots of CO2 comes out of them. These power plants have a de design lifetime of 40, 50 years. If you want China to reduce its emissions drastically by the year 2020, then essentially what you're telling China is close down your new coal-fired power plants, right? And you build them to last 40 years and kind of shut them down after five years. That's capital destruction at a massive scale. That is just unwise, right? That is just very, very possible. So for that reason, you always want to start slow. The second part of Nordhauser's conclusion, that you want to do more later, that you want to accelerate over time, the fact that you want to accelerate is robust. The rate at which you accelerate is extremely sensitive to assumptions. So depending on the discount rate that you use, depending on the, your assumptions about the capital stock turnover, depending on your assumptions about your carbon cycle, you can get very different answers to the question whether you want to accelerate at 1% per year or 2% per year or 3% per year. Right? That is extremely sensitive. <coughs> so don't pay too much stock uh, in that. The third part of Nordhauser's conclusion that it's not optimal to stabilize concentrations is robust again. Yeah. And the reason, and, and I mean, uh, this particular part of the conclusion was very upsetting to people. And as I said, he first published this uh, in 1992. And a lot of people got very upset, and a number of people have devoted a large fraction of their career to try and overturn what Nordhaus was saying. And all of them have failed. And the reason is in the very nature of cost benefit analysis and the structure of the problem. And that is depicted here, and as I argued, sort of the dynamic optimization leads to very similar recommendations as a static one, so let's just focus on the static one. So what do you do in a static cost-benefit analysis or in a static optimum? You equate the marginal costs to the marginal benefits. The marginal costs of a little bit of emission reduction are low. We argued that 30% of energy does not seem to serve any useful purpose. It means that you can reduce your, air, your energy use, at least by a little bit, without suffering a large loss, right? So, first, emission reductions are cheap. But then when you push emissions down further and further and further, the costs go up, right? And in order to stabilize concentrations, we need to push emissions all the way to here. And at that point, you begin to, I mean, I mean here we are, talking about things such as don't fill up your, don't boil a full kettle of water if you only want a single cup of tea, right? That is the sort of measures that we're talking about here. That is cheap, right? A hundred percent use reduction. We're no longer talking about a few wind turbines. We're no longer talking about a little bit of uh, emission uh, or energy efficiency. At this point, we probably have completely decarbonized the power generation sector, right? It's relatively easy. And then we're moving into transport. And then everybody drives either on biodiesel or, but of course, you want to drive on biodiesel, you need to grow all that bioenergy, you need fertilizers, right? So at that point, you need to have invented a way of fixing nitrogen and phosphate without using fossil fuels, and that gets a bit expensive, right? Or maybe you're moving to have electric cars, right? But that's not enough, right? Because then you still have emissions from aviation. Now, at the moment they are talking about electric planes. I think they're not. <laughs> uh, because batteries are still so heavy, right, that if you want enough electric power to fly up, then you have to carry so much batteries with you that at one point this becomes just impossible, right? It just batteries, and in terms of the amount of energy that you can out compared to kerosene, are just too, just too heavy. So we, we have a demonstration where there's this one plane with one guy in who could fly around the world on solar power, 
but that's not good for commercial aviation because you want to carry more than just the pilot. Siemens is now talking about a battery-powered plane and they hope to take up 20 people and fly them across the channel, right? That's where we are. We hope to do so within the next decade. But yeah, full-scale carbon-neutral aviation is still a long way off, right? So that gets very expensive or we have to stop flying, right? And then the next step is, of course, how do you get space flight without CO2 emissions? And you may say, well, I don't care much about people floating there in outer space, right? So the cost of not having space tourism is probably low, but the cost of not having satellites is quite high because GPS and everything runs on satellites and therefore a lot of the functions on your mobile phone, a lot of sort of imagery that comes from outer space is very, very valuable, right? And at the moment, we don't know how to shoot up a satellite without uh, without emitting CO2, right? And you may say, well, we have plenty of satellites out there already, but satellites have a lifetime of 10 years, right? <laughs> so if we can't shoot new ones up, that will end. Pushing or decarbonizing space flight is probably the last use of uh, fossil fuels that will ever uh, get to. That will be extremely expensive. So the, the, the shape of this curve is like this, right? A little bit of emission reduction is cheap. Complete emission reduction at the moment is unimaginable, right? And therefore very, very expensive. Now look at the shape of the marginal benefit curve. So if we have unabated emissions, the world may warm by six degrees or so, and it's easy to imagine that that would be extremely costly. So if we push in, uh, climate change down from 6 degrees to 5 degrees, that would bring a lot of benefits, right? That would sort of avoid the worst of climate change. Uh, but that's not what we want to do, right? We want to push climate change from 6 degrees to 5 degrees, from 5 degrees to 4 degrees, from 4 degrees to 3 degrees, from 3 degrees to 2 degrees. And then it already begins, you begin to think, the benefits of that from having two degrees of warming rather than three degrees of warming are a lot smaller, right? But that's not where we want to stop, right? We want to push climate change down to one degree, to a half a degree, to a tenth of a degree. And the benefit of pushing climate change from a tenth of a degree of warming in a century to a hundredth of a degree of warming in a century becomes very, very small, right? What's the benefit of that, right? So at that more point, we're actually below the measurement accuracy of uh, the temperature, global surface air temperature. But that's not where we want to stop, right? We don't want to avoid a tenth of a degree per century of warming, and we don't want to avoid a hundred of a degree of warming per century. We want to avoid all warming altogether. And it's very difficult to imagine that that would have a large benefit. So this marginal benefit curve does become very, very close, or does get very close to zero for complete emission reduction. And therefore, a cost-benefit analysis will always tell you, almost always tell you, that the optimal solution is an interior solution. You don't want unabated emissions in order to argue against unabated emissions you need to say that climate change can never have, can never cause any problem whatsoever, but, and never any problem whatsoever, ever, right? This is just a ridiculous argument to make, so you can never justify this solution. But at the same time, it is extremely difficult to justify this particular corner solution. So a cost-benefit analysis almost never goes to a corner. And that is why Despite a lot of people's best efforts, nobody, is, nobody serious has been able to overturn Nordhaus's conclusion that we, it's not optimal to stabilize concentration. There's one exception to this. I don't think it's a credible exception, uh, but other people argue differently. And that is if there is a so-called backstop technology. So if at a certain point the carbon tax goes up to, say, $100 per ton of carbon, uh, it may be that at that point we, the only energy that we build is carbon-free energy. And that would be a backstop 
technology. That at some point, renewables take over at a certain level of carbon. But that is actually not enough. What you need to have is not just that they take over at the margin, but that they take over, right? So that from that point onwards, we're only going to build renewable. And everything we build is renewable, so the backstop is sort of like abundant and able to supply the world's energy needs at a sort of a roughly constant cost, right? But even that is not enough. But you also need to, because at that point the climate problem goes away, so our willingness to pay for climate policy goes away eventually. And you actually then need to be in a situation that fossil fuels never make a comeback. So essentially the nature of a backstop technology is such at a certain point you hit a certain price level, then renewables take over, fossil fuels go away, the climate problem goes away, our willingness to pay for climate policy goes away, but fossil fuels don't come back. Even though at that point we still have plenty of coal in the ground, we still probably have plenty of gas and oil in the ground, and even if there's no climate policy anymore, we don't want to dig it out, right, and burn it, ever. And it's particularly the last assumption that I find hard to believe, right? That even if there's no climate policy anymore, fossil fuels will never make a comment. But if you do believe that, then of course you only need to drive climate, the, the carbon tax to a certain level, and then renewables will take over, and fossil fuels will never make a comment. If that is your belief, and if not mine, then you can stabilize uh, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. That's all for this morning. Uh, next week I'm going to talk about what happens if we have many decision makers in charge of many countries, rather than a single uh, philosopher queen. And this afternoon I'm going to talk about the welfare parameters that drive this whole thing, the discount rates, inequity aversion, risk aversion.